So, you know, I really love this picture because, um, you know, in nature itself, you can see the, the young, strong, uh, you know, branches and you can see the, the thin ones. So this is a beautiful picture, I think, of what's going on with the bone in terms of osteoporosis. Unfortunately, unlike this, we are not able to see the bone outside for us to you know when it is thin and when it is strong. And when it does happen, when it becomes really uh, thin, this is what happens. They start fracturing the bones. And even in that, if it happens in the spine, many times it's not something that you know we know right away and people come to us much later um, with back pain or it's just a, a, we pick it up incidentally. So, and, and this is a natural process, as you can see, a normal bone to a bone where you know, there is loss of bone. And then finally, the osteoporotic bone where... Excuse me, are we able to see this slide? I am yes. not able to yes. see on my screen. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, the slides are visible. So I thought I'll take my talk through this, the, the lovely mm -hmm. title that Jayshree has given, T to Z of bone densitometry. So uh, the principle of it, rationale, fundamentals, the procedure, how do we do the, the, the technique and how do you prepare for it? And it's so important to prepare properly for this procedure. Uh, practice how, what are the indications and clinical application, uh, pitfalls. And you will be surprised uh, on, at the number of pitfalls that are uh, you know, there in terms of uh, doing, interpretation. And progress in, you know, we, we have made a lot of progress in terms of assessing bone density. But uh, I'm, I'm sure Thomas Paul will talk a lot about TDS. And so um, moving on, the principles of uh, densitometry, we just know what goes on every single day when it comes to the bone, that the bone resorption action by the osteoclast is going on. And then the active osteoclasts come in and then they fill the craters and then mineralization happens. And, and this is the process that is going on constantly. And as an age-related process and the post-menopausal process and related to multiple disease, disorders and medications, sometimes the resorption is more. Sometimes the bone building process is slower. So all of those things contribute to, a, uh, you know, to the thinning of the bone, what we call osteoporosis. So why do we need to know the test? How, do, how else can we know the extent of the bone loss? How can we predict fracture risk? How can we know if this is just age related or something else is going on with this patient? Is it a secondary osteoporosis? And lastly, when we treat the patient, how can we monitor the therapy if we don't have the, the, the right tool to do that? And as you can see from this, there are so many techniques. There's some radiographic techniques, there are bone marker techniques, there are invasive techniques. Obviously, we don't do things like bone, you know, biopsies. It very, it's a, still a research tool. Bone marker, again, is primarily used not in a diagnostic setup, but more in a, a you know, monitoring of therapy setup. The radiographic techniques are what we have for making the diagnosis. And you'll see I've got a star next to the dual energy absorption metry, which is the gold standard and what the WHO has recommended in terms of what we should use for, um, for diagnosing osteoporosis. Of course, we have fracs and other things which are also briefly mentioned. So why not just use a plain x-ray? It's cheaper, every hospital has it. We can just do one and take a look. Really, for us to see bone loss on an x-ray, one should have lost a significant amount of bone, like 30% or more. But more importantly, it will not show us response to therapy in any quantitative way, like what a bone density can do. So obviously that is one big problem. And as far as FRAX is concerned, <clears throat> FRAX is a great tool, especially for our country. It uses clinical risk factors. I think it's um, it really helps us to think of the clinical risk factors when we use the FRAX. If we can combine FRAX and a BMD, I think the, the information we get is much more robust and, and, and more predictive. So, what about the procedure itself, the technique and preparations? A little bit about the history. Um, we've, you know, we've heard that osteoporosis is undetected and overlooked. I think it's still a lot overlooked. And it has taken several years with, you know, before actually the first commercial DEXA scanner was introduced only in 1987. 
If you think about it, it's not that long ago that the commercial first DEXA scanner um, became available. So how it works is you can see that there is a the patient, then there is a detector, and then there is a you know the, the collimator. And depending on pencil beam or flat fan beam, it either has a pinhole or a slit. And then the X-ray so source produces two photon energies. And I'll just explain this to you. So the DEXA machine will send a thin invisible beam of low dose X-ray with two distinct energy peaks through the bones. One peak is absorbed by the soft tissue and the other by the bone. So the soft tissue amount can be subtracted from the total and what remains will be the patient's bone mineral density. So then the software the machine has will compute and display the bone density measurements. And the WHO, um, Dr. Canis particularly, has, has given us these, um, this framework where um, the normal is up to minus one and osteopenia is between uh, minus one and minus 2.5 and osteoporosis anything more than minus 2.5 and severe or established osteoporosis is this with a fracture. So typically two sites are checked. We looked at, we look at the a lumbar spine, L1 to L4. And um, I also want to mention that some people have an extra vertebra L5 um, and then uh, so L1 to L4. And it's really important actually to look at all four, but sometimes we'll be, we'll end up looking only at three because either one is fractured or something else is going on. And if we include that, it will completely throw off the measurement. So what we do is measure L1 to L4 and take the total for the spine. That's very important. That's how the spine is done. And it's always important to look at the actual BMD and not just at the T-score alone, because that will then remove some of the pitfalls, which I'll explain later. So you also see that all the vertebrae naturally do not have the same bone mineral content and BMD. There's an increase between L1 and L2, which by the way, is the maximum, and then L2 to L3. And as you can see in, in this uh, lovely study in, in 148 normal women, what happens to the increase in uh, bone mineral um, content and also the percentage increase in BMD between the different vertebrae normally. And this is how the, the, the femur is looked at. You can do either the right hip or the left hip. Both are not necessary. Always important to make sure that the patient does not have a prosthetic hip or anything like that. And then we take the lowest value and, uh, and we do not include the watch triangle. So what is a T-score? Since the whole talk is T to Z, what is a T-score? T-score is when that person is, you know, ethnicity and sex matched and compared to uh, the young adult reference mean, which is around 30 years. So this is how they calculate this and come up with that number. And what is the Z-score? That is age and sex match. If it's a 58-year-old woman, it will be matched with a 58-year-old woman um, you know, of the same ethnicity. So a low Z-score has been suggested by some to be the likelihood of secondary osteoporosis. And we, it's actually just, a, I think, a flag that should go up in our head and not completely depend on that to make the diagnosis of secondary osteoporosis. So a high index of suspicion should be there. So the World Health Organization has said Z-score should be used for premenopausal women, men younger than 50 years, children and teenagers younger than 20 years. For others, we can use the T-score. So Z-score osteoporosis should not, be, you know, should not be diagnosed on the basis of densitometry criteria alone. Um, a Z-score less than minus two indicates that the diagnosis is below the expected range for age or a low bone density for chronologic age. In fact, today in the clinic, I saw someone who's just 20 years old and came to me with a T-score. You can imagine if her T-score is definitely going to be low because they're comparing it with a 30-year-old woman. She said, I've already developed osteoporosis. I'm not sure what is going to happen to my life. There are many, many caveats with this T-score, Z-score because a T-score of less than minus 2.5 does not always mean osteoporosis. It could just mean vitamin D deficiency and osteomalacia. A clinical diagnosis with something that is made with uh, a T-score greater than minus 2.5, it could be um, like an atraumatic vertebral fracture. 
and the low T score does not, I, you know, medical evaluation should really be considered, for example, celiac disease with malabsorption. So why did Professor Canis think of minus 2.5 for the diagnosis? He said such a cutoff value will identify approximately 30% of postmenopausal women as having osteoporosis using measurements made at the spine, hip, or forearm. This is approximately equal to the lifetime risk of fracture at these sites. So very quickly to summarize, T-score is the WHO diagnostic classification in postmenopausal women and men aged 50 and older. And it cannot be applied to healthy premenopausal women, men under 50 and children. So obviously for T-score, we, we use it in, in this particular population. There are sometimes there is a discordance, T-score discordance is there. Different skeletal sites have different peak bone mass at different times and may lose bone at different you know, rates. We know the vertebra loses faster and there may be different technologies, different regions of interest and different, ref different reference bases, um, different means and SD. So, but it's a very, very helpful, very important tool as you can see Fracture risk doubles with every SD decrease in bone mineral density. And we also know that it, how helpful it is in, when we match the age and the BMD. The same BMD, what it means for a younger woman, and the same BMD, what it means for a much older woman. Their 10-year their fracture probability, how it changes. And that's really important to keep in mind as well. That's also something that we call the least significant change. That's another thing to, to keep in mind. Um, L1 to L4 is about 3 to 4%. Uh, total proximal femur is about 4 to 5%. And very important always to compare these scores and also remember that BMD values from different manufacturers are not comparable because they may use different methods, different calibration, different detectors. But DEXA has multiple strengths and we really must, and right now it is the gold standard. It's quick, it's non-invasive, low radiation, can accurately predict uh, fracture risk, can be most importantly used for monitoring therapy. And we can of course use these scores for children and premenopausal women. And we can, we can also combine it with facts and get a better yield. Now, coming to actual practice, who, who is it indicated for? So, I have changed the 65 recommendation from the North guidelines to 55 for our population because people always talk about that it is, um, we are 10 years uh, earlier, our uh, population people start fracturing and, uh, and losing bone. So in my practice, what I do is all women over 55 or five years after menopause, for postmenopausal women younger than 55, it's indicated if they have a risk factor for low bone mass, such as low body weight, prior fracture, high risk medication use, disease or condition that's associated with bone loss, premature menopause below 40 or early menopause 40 to 45. And even women during menopausal transition, if they have any of these risk factors, this is something to be considered. And then for, for men, the recommendation is 70 by NOF. I typically like to use that as 60 in our Indian men. And the same thing holds good if they are under um, 60, but if they have these low body weight or prior fracture, high risk. In addition to this, adults with a fragility fracture, adults with conditions associated with low bone mass um, or bone loss, anybody taking medications, for example, steroid use for more than three months, anyone being considered for pharmacologic therapy, however old they are, anyone being treated to monitor treatment effect and anyone not receiving therapy in whom evidence of bone loss would lead to treatment. It will help us to make the decision to treat them. These are all the reasons. So just to show you, I made this infographic by putting my numbers. Um, so um, if you break a bone after 50, if you're a woman 55 or older, if you're a postmenopausal woman who's under 55, but still has risk factors, and if you're a woman of menopausal age with multiple risk factors, or if you're a man between 50 and 60 with risk factors, or you're a man 60 or older from an Indian setting. This is the practical guide I use. But if you want to use SNOF guidelines, 
just add 10 to all of these things and you will go into the uh, NOF guidelines. Which sites should be test? I already mentioned this L1, L1 to L4 as far as the lumbar spine and one dip in all patients. But forearm bone density should be measured under the following circumstances. Hip or spine cannot be measured or integrated. Hyperparathyroidism and very, very obese patients over the weight limit for the DEXA table. Are there any contraindications for DEXA? Pregnancy, recent GI contra studies recommend waiting for at least 72 hours before central DEXA, body weight exceeding that limit for DEXA scanners, and people who have bilateral hip or bilateral hip pins or screws would prevent the hip sites from being scanned. And metallic rods or fusion devices in the lumbar spine prevent scanning at this site as well. So are there pitfalls in DEXA measurement? So the ACE guidelines for 2020 says accurate bone mineral density scans and reports are crucial for appropriate diagnosis. Think of positioning errors, faulty data input, inadequate training, et cetera, and examine the DEXA scans carefully. So we have to consider all of these things while examining. Identification, the person, good scan criterion, region of interest, the area being scanned and how we are interpreting it. So I'm going to show you a few interesting pictures. Image of a proximal femur shows improper positioning of femoral head resulting in lesser trochanter and normal femoral neck piece score of minus 0 0.9. The same thing after appropriate rotation, the lesser trochanter is not depicted. Modification of hip rotation to proper position change the, the neck T score of minus 1.3, which indicates osteopenia. Um, for example, if they place the uh, region of interest in the boundary includes the bone other than the area of interest, um, then this is the score that you get. But if you correctly place the, the area of interest, equipment of, uh, all operated to reduce the region of interest size. And according to morphologic features and everything, it will correctly give you the, the femoral T score. It, it changes from minus 2.6 to minus 2.1. And especially, this becomes important not during diagnosis, but when you're monitoring therapy. When you've seen a half SD improvement, just by proper positioning, this becomes really important. And so, and proper rotation is very important when hip DEXA is being done. Look at this woman. <coughs> She's a 65-year-old woman who underwent an upward GI study the day before the DEXA. And you can see what, look at what's there. The contrast shows the, um, the artifacts are from contrast material that is sitting there. And that is completely changing the T-score the, 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 the of the patient. So keep in, you know, take, that history must be taken if they've had any contrast studies. And look at this one, um, L3 vertebral body, plain radiograph showing a calcified mesenteric lymph node. So that vertebra will look very much stronger on the uh, on the uh, you know DEXA scoring, and this one is an increased density corresponding a dense pedicle. So this is why it is so important. Every DEXA has to be matched with a spine film because the spine film will pick up sclerosis, artifacts, pedicle thickening, um, you know calcium tablet sitting there, aortic calcification, you name it, it will pick up everything. Um, so again, uh, showing pedicle sclerosis and, and um, uh, really important, this shows the increased density of the vertebral body that corresponds to the fracture on the radiograph below. If we had not done the radiograph, we might not have picked this up. So it's really important to always, I mean, for us, I'm always getting a spine film every time we are making the diagnosis of osteoporosis. Um, also to pick up any incident vertebral fracture. And this is a, a dual energy, uh, I mean, this is a DEXA of the spine in a patient with such severe osteoporosis. It actually, you can, the, this is simulating a defect on the, if you can look, it, uh, look at it. But if you look at the x-ray, it did not confirm the defect. Um, and this is a patient that um, dramatically suggests a sclerotic process seen on the x-ray because of a marked increase in the BMD at L2 and L3 compared to L1 and L4. Remember I said L1 to L2, it goes up actually. 
and I told her, but when you, whenever you see a marked increase, we, some suspicions should go up in our head. And this is the aortic calcification I mentioned to you, increasing the bone mineral density. Even though studies have uh, shown that uh, while a significant number of women over the age of 60 have aortic calcification, it may not change the BMD in a very significant way, but something to keep in mind. This is the effect of, um, as you can see, what facet sclerosis, which is very common, facet sclerosis can do to bone density. So some of the potential errors are improper placement of the patient, patient movement during the scan, inaccurate calibration, the presence of vascular calcification or arthritic uh, artifacts, and in inappropriate interpretation of the DEXA results by the practitioner. So practice makes perfect. So we keep on doing this. We'll be picking up a lot of things. And um, I think um, it's, it's, uh, it's not rocket science. It's something that we can learn very easily. All of these will negatively impact the value of the BMD results for fracture prediction. As I mentioned earlier, pancreatic calcification, renal stones, gall stones, contrast agents, calcium tablets. In fact, it's recommended we tell our patients not to take calcium tablets the day before they come for the next up, aortic calcifications and fractures. So um, this is the picture to show how a, uh, a patient who may have prosthesis um, can actually have a, uh, if, it, if it is done, it should not have been done. If it is done, uh, how it can seriously affect the cell. This is a patient who had a, a remote history of myelography, and we know that these things can stay in for a very long time. Densities overlying L3 and L5 retain myelographic contrast material. And this is a patient who had actually vertebroplasty, and, and the DEXA was, um, and the fractures were sustained a year ago, and vertebroplasty was done. And excluding the L1 and L3 from the analysis will change the L1 to L4 score from minus 2.1 to minus 3.8. So again, very important to keep in mind. Um, I've come to the end of my talk where I just want to say that we have made great progress in, um, I think, osteoporosis diagnosis and management. Huge strides, actually. Um, the kind of uh, medications that we have now, the, the kind of research that has uh, shown us um, you know, how we can... Uh, do sequential therapy, combination therapies, drug holidays. We do all of those things. Where we are really failing is actually to do an initial diagnosis of um, uh, osteopenia or osteoporosis and start prevention, which is very, very important. Uh, then we have now um, vertebral uh, fracture assessments and um, you know TBS, which uh, I'm sure Thomas will talk about. So the ACE guidelines has now said you can uh, differentiate your people into, uh, into high risk and very high risk. High risk is T score between minus one and minus 2.5. History of fragility fracture of the hip or spine. And T score between the same range minus one and minus 2.5. And the frax 10 year probability of major osteoporotic fracture of greater than 20%. So this, this is where the clinical thing will come in as well, clinical risk factors. So we cannot just take BMD alone. It's not a one-dimensional approach, but a multi-dimensional approach. You take the clinical risk scoring, do the facts, get the BMD, and put it all together. And very high-risk people, of course, are previous fractures, people with low bone density, who are elderly, frail, increased risk of falls, very low T-scores, and taking glucose for After having done this, we can take this approach. So um, I may have done with the, um, okay. Uh, okay. So encourage basic bone health for all individuals over 50. I think it should be for all people throughout their life, um, including regular weight bearing exercises, calcium, um, vitamin D, fall prevention strategies. If they are under 50, we only do selective BMD testing. I mentioned earlier what indications we have. Uh, like fragility fractures, systemic steroids, hypogonadism, premature menopause. If they are between 50 and 64, targeted BMD testing, fragility fractures, systemic steroids, osteopenia on, um, on X-ray, and other clinical features, factors. And if they are more than 65, um, see some of these things are 
um, also, if, when these guidelines come out, the insurance companies will not pay for the others. They will now pay for only for a 65-year-old woman if she has none of these other risk factors, um, which I think is a great disservice for, for most women, and which is why I moved all the ages by 10 years for our population. We in India are doing the opposite thing. We are doing DEXAs on 40-year-olds and 35-year-olds and you know, uh, as part of master health checkups and things like that, which is also very, very harmful because it puts the fear of all sorts of things in the patient's mind. And some of them even get started on um, you know, pharmacologic therapy for osteoporosis when in reality, they should not have been tested at all. So once we've done the BMD testing, then you can go into this low risk, moderate and high risk based upon FRAC scoring and then decide on whether they are going to benefit from treatment, what else additional things that we are going to do to uh, decide on the treatment for this particular patient. So BMD testing, I think is a important tool, the most you know, important tool that we have right now. The central DEXA, which is what I've been talking all along is the best tool. I did not even talk about peripheral DEXA. It was by design so that I don't, you know, even talk about it. Um, I don't believe in it. And, and even in, you know, mass screening and things, it can only be, I think, maybe a, an education tool. So um, the, the, the best is a central DEXA. So um, on that note, I want to thank you all for inviting me to give this uh, really interesting talk. Thank you so much.